and welcome back to Mining Networks. I'm joined with Andrew Dinning here, who is CEO of Sarama Resources. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So let's just start by getting a nice overview of the company. Okay, yeah, Sarama, we're a, a, a late stage gold explorer. We work in West Africa in Burkina Faso. Um, we've got quite a big project there. It's got just shy of three million ounces on it at the moment. And we've been busy drilling um, since May this year. We're a dual listed company. So we're listed in Canada and Australia. We did the Australian listing in May this year, and since then we've been going very hard drilling in the in the field. Brilliant. So just to get kind of a bit of insight, what's the market cap share structure like, and how much cash is in the bank and burn rate, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. We we uh, market cap um, is around 15 million. Um, we have around four million in Aussie in the bank at the end of June, at the end of the June quarter. Um, the capital structure is fairly clean. Um, our primary listing is in Canada, so we have around 140 million shares total. Um, so 40 million on the ASX, the balance on the TSX, but Australia is a CDI, so it's a derivative. Um, yeah, so we, we are a, a you know, fairly tight capital structure. We don't have a big warrant overhang. Um, so yeah, generally fairly clean. Brilliant. So let's go into the geology a little bit. What is the geology of where your licenses are? Yeah, the, the geology where we work, at, we've, we've got a n number of deposits in our main project area. So the two main deposit, one's called Bondi and the other one's called Tankoro. Bondi's a, it's a conglomerate on a mafic sediment contact. Um, it's a very high grade deposit, around half a million ounces in, in that particular deposit. We acquired that from Warzone uh, several years ago. It's a, it's a high grade free milling deposit. The second deposit, Tankoro, which is a discovery made by Sarama, is about two and a half million ounces, and that's different to Bondi. That's a, a porphyry dike system. It's quite a big system. We've drilled it uh, for about 16 kilometres, but most of the ounces are in two prospect areas. And we've just made a new discovery uh, in June that's is very different again. It's a flat, looks like a flat quartz vein, high grade quartz vein structure that cuts across all the porphyry dikes. So that's something new for us as well. Definitely, it sounds quite exciting. So along with the geology, is there history in the area um, of previous mining being done there? No, um, what we've got is a, it's a maiden discovery. So we put the first drill holes into the area where we work. To the west of us, uh, we have Endeavour Mining and they've got a discovery there. They have about one and a half million ounces. Um, we think maybe it needs to grow a bit before it's big enough for them, but it's very close to us. So we, we'd actually like to put it all together. So. Within that area, within Tankoro, without the permit boundary, um, there's around four million ounces within a five or six kilometre radius. So there's a lot of gold in the area um, and that's all shallow. So all our resource starts pretty much at surface. A third of the resource is in oxide as well, which is good from a development point of view. Um, and then obviously the balance is, is in fresh, but probably 70% of the resource sits within 150 metres of surface. So. We, we, you know, we like the project a lot. We're over the threshold from a size point of view and a development point of view. So the drilling we're doing now is just really targeting, I guess, the low hanging fruit and the obvious ounces um, that we can drag into the next resource update. And then at that point, we'll probably put a pin in it and, and move it into feasibility. Definitely, no, that, that would make sense to do so. But you mentioned there a little bit about your neighbours. Um, are there any other significant neighbours in the area? And do you think consolidation would be possible of the land packages? Yeah, that's a pretty interesting question. There was a lot of neighbours in the area and Endeavour's bought them all. So <laughs> are we're they the going to buy you? <laughs> we're the last one standing, yeah. Okay. Well, don't know, you have to ask them that. Yeah. But um, yeah, we did have Taranga as a neighbour and we had Semifo as a neighbour. Um, originally in that part of the belt from Manor in the north, which is about 150 kilometres away, through to where we work, there was about probably 13 or 14 companies about eight or nine years ago. And now it's just Endeavour, Sarama, um, Thor Exploration's got a bit of ground there, and then Fortuna Silver. So Fortuna Silver actually took over Rocks Gold, I think that was last year, so that's even transacted. So the whole area is consolidated and, and really it's dominated by us and Endeavour and Fortuna now. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting next couple of years ahead to see if Endeavour goes that last step or, or what they actually do. Yeah, definitely. So your projects, you, you've got, obviously, they're all in very close proximity, but they are separate deposits, aren't they? You were mentioning about the OB and some of the other. Um, yeah. So could you just talk to me a little bit about those and how you, are you infill drilling? Like, are you hoping that become one? The, the we, We're not infill drilling per se, but the mineralised corridor, the, the okay. gold corridor, it's about 16 kilometres long and one to one and a half kilometres wide. 
So 80% of the answers sit in what we call the MM and MC prospects. So that the two kind of big solid areas, so there's a big dilation area there. Um, the new discovery I was talking about with the flat zone, that's in the south of that corridor. And that corridor runs for another five or six kilometres onto Endeavours ground as well, so it's big. But our, our view is that there's plenty of space between where we've drilled to make new discoveries. And we've got four areas like that that we've just drilled where that has been the case. So we're looking to add ounces, you know, the very high value in between where we've already drilled because there's still a lot of space. And I think sometimes we lose perspective of that. So if this was in Australia, for example, if it was in the eastern goldfields in Western Australia where I spent a lot of time running mines, it would equate to places like Kandana or Agnew or St Ives. But typically those areas would be owned by four or five companies and we control the whole lot. So it's, it's a mining camp really. Definitely. So this is the first time you're drilling for five years, isn't it? So was there quite extensive drilling before that um, in this specific area? Or? Yeah, there was. Um, when we put the ground together, we did quite a lot of drilling and then we entered into a joint venture with African Barrack, which became Acacia Mining. Um, and they were earning in on the project. And I think anyone that's familiar with their history know that they had a few problems in Tanzania and they stopped working on the project. And mm -hmm. it took us a couple of years to, I guess, buy, you know, sort out to buy that JV out. So that, that was quite restrictive for us. Um, so we managed to do that. We ended up doing the final deal with Barrick. Um, and Barrick were, you know, they were very good to deal with, but they did take a, a small royalty as, as part of buying them out. Um, that was probably the main hold up. And then there was a few permitting issues that came up that delayed us another 12 months. We got all that cleaned up last year. Um, and as soon as that was done, we pressed a button on the Australian listing in in January and, and moved that ahead. And here we are. No, and here we are now. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's very, I must say, when we started drilling again after such a long break, yeah. it was, we were very happy to be doing that. Um, it's quite frustrating knowing the type of quality of project that we've got, uh, knowing exactly where you want to drill and you, you can't, so. No, I can imagine. It's back there, yeah. Yeah, it's a frustrating delay, but at least you're back at it. Um, and yeah. so how are you finding ex like the exploration process in Burkina Faso, and uh, not just from an operating perspective, but also from an investor perspective? Yeah, look, I think Burkina geologically, you know, it's a very good country if you want to look for gold. Yeah. The discovery costs are low. Um, our discovery costs typically are under $10 an ounce. Mm -hmm. Um, the discovery rates as well for us historically is between 7 and 10 ounces per metre drilled. Yeah. So that's also very good. Most, most deposits start at surface as well. Um, so from an exploration point of view, you know, it's pretty straightforward to explore. It's open savanna. If you go further south, you know, into the more tropical countries, you're dealing with jungle or secondary growth jungle. Yeah, so the infrastructure side of things gets <laughs> yeah. problematic. But yeah. where we are, it's open savanna. Um, so from an exploration point of view, it's, it's good. Uh, we use gold in soils as a pathfinder to take us into areas. So that's a relatively inexpensive and quick way to, to bring you in. Um, so exploring's good. The mining code there is it's a modern mining code. It's quite transparent. It's quite well set out. Um, most of the delays we experience are due to the administration of the mining code, um, but that's not limited to Burkina Faso. Pretty much most countries are like that. But when you do have a line of sight to a development, because the, the government takes a 10% free carried interest, they tend to move fairly quickly on that. Um, if you look at West African resources, they had the San Brado mine. Um, they made the main discovery on that in 2016. They drilled it, permitted it, and had it built, poured first gold in 2020. So that shows how quickly you can get things done um, once you have that kind of line of sight to where you want to be. Because the government obviously is looking for the revenue and the jobs yeah. um, and, and you know, all the benefits that mining brings to their economy. Well, for sure, the incentive is there, so... Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So in, in, your kind of, in your own eyes, what's the vision for Sarama over the next five years? Now, over the next five years, we'd like to be in production. So we've got 50,000 metre program that we're on now, and that, that should crystallise a lot of the, I guess, the easy opportunities from an exploration point of view. By the end of next year, we'd like to have a study out that will frame it up for the market, what the project looks like. We've got a pretty good idea what it looks like now. We've done a lot of work internally. Um, we've got a lot of skills internally to kind of look at things. We don't outsource a lot of that. Um, and then I guess it's moving into production. And the big question for us will be 
how big it will be and what the configuration will be. So we envisaged establishing it just as a plain vanilla CIL oxide plant initially, and then there'll be a series of upgrades over time as you go through material types. If we can convince Endeavour to part with the ground next to us, then that'll change the configuration again. It'll make it a much larger project because that'll be a, a five million ounce project then. So really we have to do that justice. Um, but yeah, we would like to think in the next five years we'll have built and commissioned a mine and the question will be what it will look like. No, definitely, that, that's exciting to hear. So just to kind of wrap things up here, um, two nice questions I'd like to end with. So over the past 12 months, what are you most proud of um, as a company for achieving? I think I can guess which one it will be, but if you can pick one thing you're most proud of. Getting back drilling. Yeah. That's, uh, like I say, it's, it's great to be back drilling again. Mm -hmm. and. We stopped because of the rainy season now, so. Yeah. But we had a lot of momentum, so we look forward to picking that up again next year. How limited are you with the rainy season? Is it? We typically park up. Most companies park up. You, you can normally diamond drill in the rainy season, but we're cognizant that's when the farmers have their crops in. We don't want to drive all over their crops or whatever. I mean, obviously you pay compensation, but it's it's not it's not a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, but typically as well, you need time to decompress because when you are drilling, you're going flat out. Mm -hmm. So we take that period for, you know, the couple of expats we have, they go home and decompress and we kind of go through all the results and work out what they mean and kind of tee ourselves up to get into it the following season. Definitely. And how is the relationship with the locals in the area? Yeah, it's very good. Um, we've been established there for a long time. So, you know, typically if we're going into a new area to drill, we'll sit down with the chiefs and everyone else and just explain to them what we want to do and, and I guess get their tacit approval for what, we, what we're planning. Um, you know, a big part's expectation management from when we first get there. Um, we just won an award actually in Australia for, um, I think it's an Emerging ESG Leader Award sponsored by the Mineral Councils of Australia um, for the work we've been doing in Bikina with our community programs. So we, you know, we obviously place a fairly high importance on that. Like, it, it's the right thing to do, but from a business point of view, anyway, it's it's important. But for us, you know, we're a guest of those people. We may have the mineral rights, but at the end of the day, we see ourselves as part of the community. Um, we work a lot with them on on what you know where we're going going to work, what we're going to do, if what we're doing impacts them, how best to manage that. So it's, it's an important dialogue to have. Definitely, no, that's great to hear that um, you guys are very involved with the ESG sort of side of things. Um, and what's the key milestone we can look out for over the next 12 months from you guys? I think the key milestones is completion of this 50,000 metre drill program, which should be middle of next year. So probably at the end of this upcoming season, which will be June, July. Uh, resource update quickly after that, because we'll do a lot of the work as we go along. Um, and then by the end of the year, probably a PEA that we can publish in Canada. Um, can't publish in Australia because of exchange rules, but we can publish it in Canada. Um, so that probably the two, two or three big ones next year is completion of the drill program, resource update, and then framing up what the project looks like for the market. Well, it sounds like an exciting 12 months, so I look forward to seeing those. Um, but thank you so much for your time today, Andrew. It's been a pleasure. No, thank you.